five ways that you can increase the fat loss during your fasting. Now, some of these things you might already be doing, but you might learn some better timing to squeak a little bit more fat loss out of it. So the first one is going to be utilizing a sauna, and there's some really cool new science that we've seen now. So there was a study that was published in Medicina Sportiva that took a look at subjects that did seven bouts of 30-minute sauna sessions every second day. Okay, what they wanted to measure here was what was overall happening with the level of fat oxidation and just fat circulating in their body. They found that just one bout of sauna ended up increasing the levels of free fatty acids in their bloodstream, also increased their human growth hormone levels, and also increased their level of adrenocorticotropin hormone, which tells us that basically saunas are increasing this adrenaline response that allows us to burn fat. What's interesting is that just because we have levels of free fatty acids elevated in the blood, doesn't mean that we're magically burning it. There's two stages to fat loss. Lipolysis, where we have more fats entering into the blood out of the stored tissue, and we have oxidation, where we actually burn it. What's interesting is that there are some studies that demonstrate that using a sauna could elevate your metabolism by 20% for the hours following sauna usage. So if you go in a sauna in a fasted state, where your body is already optimized for using fats, because that's the stage that it's in, it's wanting to use fats during that stage, you go in a sauna, you increase your metabolic rate, but you also increase your level of fat oxidation and your levels of growth hormone, which drive up this fat burning process even more. But there was another study that was published in the journal Annals of Medicine that was really interesting, that it found that when subjects went into a sauna just a few times per week compared to one time per week, they had significantly lower levels of C-reactive protein, significantly lower levels of interleukin-6, just lower inflammation overall. Now, what does inflammation have to do with fat loss? Inflammation is one of the leading issues that we face when it comes to insulin resistance. If we have high levels of inflammation, you typically see high levels of insulin resistance. High levels of insulin resistance means that your body has to produce lots of insulin all the time to try to keep up. Insulin stands in the way of fat loss. So saunas might improve your insulin resistance by reducing your inflammation, but the most important thing that you can take away from this is if you utilize a sauna during a fasted period, right after you get out of the sauna, go for a walk, even if it's a short walk. Here's the thing, you just liberated a bunch of fats into the bloodstream. Go use them. Your body is going to use those fats in a fasted stage. So if you already are fasted and you went in a sauna, you've liberated a bunch of fats go walk for 10 minutes and your body will oxidize those fats. The two stages, they're liberated into the bloodstream and now you can actually burn them. This leads me into the next one, which is walking specifically. Why is walking so ideal for fasting? Well, because if you look at the data, you find that walking is very muscle sparing. You're at a low intensity and there's some data to back this up. The Journal of Exercise, Nutrition, and Biochemistry published a paper that had subjects walk at 50 to 60% of their VO2 max three times per week for 12 weeks. What they found with this is that these subjects ended up losing significantly more fat and they ended up oxidizing more fat as a whole. They ended up having reductions in subcutaneous fat, reductions in visceral fat, and of course reductions in inflammation as well. Well, okay, we know that walking is going to be good for fat loss, okay? This has kind of been established in other videos of mine and other data, but what about how it coincides specifically with fasting? Well, with this, we look at a study that was published in the International Journal of Obesity. This was fascinating because it wanted to determine, is walking in a fasted state going to allow you to burn more fat than walking in a fed state? So they had subjects eat breakfast or stay fasted and then walk on a treadmill incline for 45 minutes. Okay, what they found is that the group that did not have breakfast had higher levels of circulating non-esterified fatty acids before they worked out, during their workout, after their workout, and even 30, 60 minutes after their workout. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that you're oxidizing more fat in a fasted state. What they found is that if subjects had breakfast and then went for a walk, their levels of carb oxidation were higher before, during, and after the walking session. Now, both are great for losing weight, but arguably fatty acid oxidation would be better than carb oxidation for burning fat. Burning carbs just means you're burning the carbs. You're still burning calories, you're still burning weight, but burning fat is arguably better, right? So essentially what we've learned from this is that more lipolysis occurred in the fasted group. 
Now, in your case with intermittent fasting, the longer that you're fasting, the more that you're deep into that lipolysis, fatty acid oxidation state already. So going for an easy walk is gonna be one of the best possible things that you can do. Now, as far as going for a walk after a sauna, the one thing you wanna pay attention to is that you're adequately rehydrating, okay? So we wanna be hydrated. Being hydrated is going to allow us to utilize more fat as well. And I've got some other data to back that up. But if you go in a sauna for 20 or 30 minutes and you sweat and then you go for a walk and you're fasted because your insulin levels are low, you're probably urinating more, it's very important that you add in electrolytes into the mix. So I popped the link down below for Element Electrolytes. That link will get you a free sample pack, a free variety pack with any purchase. So when you do order something from Element at drinklmnt.com slash Thomas, you get a free variety pack along with that. So my favorite is the citrus salt. I've been on that kick lately, but the mango chili, the lemon habanero, those are really good flavors as well. But the citrus salt just kind of has this like good lemon lime flavor. And if you ever want to do something interesting, if you mix it with like a little bit of carbonated water, or you even mix it with some green tea, it just adds a completely different taste. So adding it to green tea, it has this like reaction where it kind of froths up. So it's really interesting. I encourage you to try it. So anyway, that link is down below for LMNT. They're perfect fasting electrolytes because you can get ones that have no flavors, that have zero calories. And even still, we're talking one to two calories, like a negligible amount in the other packets. So check them out down below. This next one is one that's gonna get a lot of people excited, and that's properly utilizing apple cider vinegar. This is newer research. We've known that apple cider vinegar is good for glucose modulation, right? We know that it's good for helping us out with glycemic control. Meaning if we have it before eating carbs or after eating carbs, it might help reduce that glucose spike but it looks as though there's some recent evidence that shows how it can help stimulate fat loss more. So we look at a study that was published in Bioscience, Biotechnology, and Biochemistry. They had subjects consume 15 milliliters, 30 milliliters, or placebo of apple cider vinegar. They did this for 12 weeks and they found that both apple cider vinegar groups had reductions in BMI, reductions in subcutaneous fat, reductions in visceral fat, and most importantly, reductions in triglycerides. Why are triglycerides so important here? Well, triglycerides are the storage form of fat. Okay, so if we understand what's happening with apple cider vinegar, this all makes sense. Apple cider vinegar inhibits lipogenesis. It stops new fat formation. And a lot of times we end up in this perpetual cycle of liberating fats out of the tissue into the bloodstream, but then we never actually use those fats. So those fats get stored back into the tissue again. It's this endless cycle, it's pointless. Liberate fats, store them again. We want to liberate fats and burn them. So it turns out that acetic acid in vinegar, it inhibits the gene expression of fatty acid synthase and acetyl carboxylase, which are huge for forming triglycerides. So what's happening here? Well, that means that we are liberating fats, but we're not able to restore them as triglycerides. This is huge. And this is all mediated by what is called the AMPK phosphorylation pathway. So when this happens, essentially, apple cider vinegar is driving up AMPK and making our body think that we are in a deeper caloric deficit than we actually are. So this process in and of itself stimulates lipolysis and oxidation. So apple cider vinegar in a fasted state will stimulate the fatty acids to go into the bloodstream, it'll stimulate oxidation, and it will prevent the reforming of fat. This is huge. And when all of this happens, you have huge genetic changes that are occurring at nuclear receptor protein levels, like PPAR alpha, where you're actually developing a stronger affinity for the cell to burn fat. What does all this mean in simple human terms? Apple cider vinegar might literally help you burn fat, and it literally will stop fat formation. And when you're fasting, this is hugely beneficial. And if you're not fasting, having apple cider vinegar in the middle of a lull between meals, like in the valley between meals, might help you burn more fat. So you eat breakfast, maybe a couple hours later you have apple cider vinegar. Then you eat lunch, then maybe a couple hours later you have apple cider vinegar. You have apple cider vinegar at the bottom of your valleys, right? In between your meals versus with your meals. That's kind of an interesting thing. Now you can still take it with your meals if you're trying to get more of a glycemic control effect, but that's not really applicable here. Okay, this one's kind of fun. Drinking 500 milliliters of water. Now, in this particular case, this would be straight up water with no electrolytes in it, okay? I want you to sip on electrolytes throughout the course of your fast, but occasionally I want you to drink 500 milliliters of straight water. 
Why straight water? What does this do? Well, if you look at a study published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, they had subjects consume 500 milliliters of water or 500 milliliters of saline. When the subjects consumed 500 milliliters of water, they found that their resting energy expenditure increased by about 20 to 25%, literally increased their metabolism. But that this did not happen with the saline. The reason is, is because with the water, you sort of create these like local changes in osmolarity between different regions. This alone actually demands stuff from the body. It demands energy. So these changes in osmolarity, when you have straight up water versus having water with salt in it, can actually drive up your metabolism. So you might be thinking, oh, why would I ever have electrolytes then? Well, if you're not adequately hydrated in the first place, this process doesn't work. So what I recommend you do is sip on electrolytes throughout the course of the day. Don't pound like one batch of them. Don't just take electrolytes and like slam it. Sip on electrolytes and then occasionally have a bolus of like 500 milliliters of water to increase your metabolic rate. That's a quick and easy way to increase your metabolism without adding any calories whatsoever and get more benefit out of fasting. Now we have to look at some newer research with black coffee. This is fascinating, okay, because when we talk about that pointless cycle of liberating fats and then storing them again, that's kind of where we were at with coffee. Okay, with coffee, we were like, we know coffee stimulates lipolysis. We, we know it releases fats into the bloodstream, but does it actually help us burn them too? Well, there's some new data. There's a study published in Clinical Nutrition, had subjects drink coffee, and it measured 90 minutes before and 240 minutes after consumption. Okay, and they measured levels of free fatty acid turnover. What they found is that lipid turnover with the caffeine group increased by 2x and overall metabolic effect increased 13%. Okay, but there's more to it. So basically, yes, there was more lipid turnover, more actual activity of fats being liberated and potentially oxidized, but it increased the thermic effect by 13%. So there was a huge change in overall just body temperature and thermic effect of metabolism. When they actually looked at the fat turnover, they found that 24% of the fatty acids were oxidized and 76% were recycled. Recycled meaning put back into triglyceride form. So at first that sounds bad. You're like, oh, that's 76% being like turned back over into fat. Well, no, you still got that 24% that just got burned. So you're looking like total net of 44% increase when you look at all the data in fatty acid oxidation. So drinking coffee doesn't just liberate fat, it actually helps you burn fat. So before we used to think, okay, we drink coffee and we have to go work out. We liberate the fat and then we have to burn it. And we still should do that. But now we're seeing like, wait a minute, coffee actually stimulates the fat burning process too. We actually incinerate the calories. So drinking some coffee, prior to going into a sauna in a fasted state and then going for a walk, holy cow, you've got like a perfect recipe here for massive fat loss. Not to mention there was a study published in the journal Functional Foods that found that the chlorogenic acid and other compounds in coffee reduce inflammation as well, independent of caffeine. So now we have an inflammation reducing effect that can lower insulin levels and help you burn fat more. So you put that all together, you can do this all at once, or you can sprinkle it in throughout the course of your fasting period. But by doing these, it's not just a small negligible amount. You could do it at a small scale with shorter fasts, or you could do it at a larger scale with more prolonged fasts. Bottom line is, these are five things you just should be doing. I'll see you tomorrow.